Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany where I have new videos every week about books and the geeky mom lifestyle. In today's video I am talking about my 20 favorite books that I read in 2020. Are finally through with 2020. It is 2021. Hooray. So excited. <laughs> it was a rough year for a lot of people for a lot of reasons, but I will say it was a fantastic reading year for me. I read more books than I've ever read before in my life. I read 370 books in 2020, which, which is just wild. And I want to say up front, because like I get a couple of different responses to this when I talk about how much I read. Um, there are people who I think feel intimidated by it or feel like there should be pressure to read that much. There is not. Like if you read one book in 2020, you are doing phenomenal. It was a rough year. And if you're even reading like one book, you're a reader and that's great. And I have no expectations of other people to need to read the volume that I do. I don't watch much television. I love reading. I'm a pretty fast reader and it is my main source of entertainment. And uh, I don't set out to try to read as much as I do, but this year that's what happened. So 370 books and I had to cull down this number. 370 books, out of those 370, 29 of them were eligible to make this list. 29 were books that I gave six stars to, and in my personal rating scale, a six star rating is what I give to a favorite of the year or a favorite of all time. Uh, so this was rough because I had to like organize my babies, my favorite books of the year, and get the cream of the crop, my 20 favorite books that I read this year. Don't worry though, the other books that didn't make it into this list you are going to be seeing in other videos because I'm also going to be doing a best of or favorites of the year in different genres and so all of those books you're going to see in some of those videos. But today we're talking about my top 20 and I force ranked them. I put them in order from 20 to 1 and Th this was also very difficult. <laughs> One thing that is interesting about 2020 as opposed to the last two years is it was a little bit harder for me to make a decision about what was my favorite book of the year. In the past couple of years it was like super obvious. I mean The Starless Sea for 2019, The Name of the Wind for 2018 were runaway favorites easily my favorite. This year I had a lot of really fantastic books um, and but it took a little while for me to make decisions about what should be at the top of that list. So we're going to dive into what all these books are, but a couple of things ahead of time. Considering the fact that I did read 370 books this year, a little less than 8% of the books that I read were eligible to make this list, so it's it's not a huge percentage of my reading. And the other thing that I want to point out about this, which was interesting when I started curating what was going to be on here and what were my favorite books that I read this year, is I, I noticed a few things. One thing that you're going to see is there is a lot of diversity in the books that made my favorites list. And that's kind of intentional in that my goal is to try to have close to half the books that I'm reading being written by authors of color or people who are not Caucasian. And I'm aiming to have a significant number of the books that I'm reading written by queer authors. I, you're going to get a whole stats video from me, so I'm not going to go into details here. But I did take a quick look at some of my stats for 2020, and I was pretty pleased. About 45% of the books that I read were written by authors of color, and I think about 25% of the books that I read were written by queer authors. And so you see that reflected in my favorites list. I did a whole live stream with Ashley from Bookish Realm and Mara from Books Like Whoa and some other really great people that I will link up above if you haven't seen it yet, where we talked about the importance of reading diversely and tips and tricks for how to do that in a sustainable way, partly by focusing on genres that you love and that's something that I've done and so what you're gonna see is there's a lot of diversity here. In fact only five of the books that made my favorites list for the year are written by straight white authors. Um, but it's in a variety of different genres and so hopefully this can give you some sense of when you make that a priority in your reading, you can come away with some really, really amazing books that you discover. So that's one thing I wanted to say. The other thing I want to say before I get into the actual list of books is you're going to notice that something I love in my reading is authors who use stories as a way of talking about important thematic issues. 
that is something I really appreciate and love. It's something that I look for, especially in speculative fiction and in romance. Most of my favorites in those genres are favorites not just because I enjoyed the story and had fun reading it, but also because there was something deeper or bigger that I felt like the author was getting at. And so that is not true of everybody. That doesn't necessarily have to be true for your favorite books of the year. But if you see a lot of me talking about that in these books, just know that that is something that I particularly enjoy in my reading and uh, tends to be a feature in many of my favorites of the year. Okay, so that's a lot of talking. With that said, let's go ahead and actually look at what are the books. Oh man, guys, this was so hard. I'm still not totally sure of all the details, but I feel pretty confident in the general makeup of this list and placement of it and the book that I picked as my favorite of the year. So we're going to start at number 20 and count down to number one, my top favorite of the year. Coming in at number 20 and eking in in December was The City We Became by N.K. Jemisin. I am a huge fan of N.K. Jemisin's work and this is one I was determined to finally get around to read this year and I did like right in the last few days of 2020 and I ended up really liking it. I know this is not everybody's cup of tea and I, one thing that I will say about this is it's the sort of book that the more familiar you are with New York City the more you're probably going to get out of this book. Not to say that you can't read it if you're not super familiar with New York City but uh, a lot of the richness here is drawn from that. Having lived in New York myself now for uh, about four and a half years, there were a lot of things I took away from this and I thought that she nailed so many aspects of what New York is and the, the personality and qualities of the different boroughs. New York City is divided up into five boroughs, which is, ends up being important in this story. Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Staten Island. And The City We Became is probably N.K. Jemisin's most overtly political book, which some people aren't going to like. I don't have a problem with it. I enjoyed it. All of her books are pretty political if you're reading them for that, but I think because this is set in an alternate modern day New York City, it's the most obviously political. The City We Became is doing two major things. I mean, it's doing a lot more than that, but we're going to focus on two of the biggest things that this book is and is doing. One is it is a love letter to New York City, and it's got a lot of New York deeply embedded in this and I really loved that and appreciated it. The other thing that it's doing that I found to be really interesting is it's a story that is subverting the racism and homophobia and misogyny that is found in Lovecraft's work and it is co-opting Lovecraftian ideas and themes in a story that is celebrating diversity and tackling issues of racism, homophobia, misogyny, and things like gentrification and real things that affect New York City. So um, I think that's really interesting as a project. I enjoyed the way she did it. I thought it was really smart. And for sure, this was one of my favorite books of the year. So I get why this is hit and miss for people. It's a very specific type of story, but I really loved it. And it is number 20 on my favorites of the year. Then coming in at number 19 is a really fantastic YA debut fantasy. This is Ray Bearer by Jordan Ifuego. I feel like I've been recommending this to so many people this year because it's such a strong debut and it's really well done fun YA fantasy novel. The world building is really good. It's got great characters. The plot is super interesting with good twists and turns. It's a multi-POV African-inspired fantasy story and I really loved it. I'm excited to see what book two does. I have very high hopes for book two. It's always, I'm always a little like nervous, right? When you get an amazing debut that's the first in a series and you're like, I really hope that the next book is as good as I want it to be. And sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. But um, I thought this was really phenomenal. And you're actually going to see quite a few debuts on this list. 2020 was the year of debuts. Like, they were rocking it. it. It was pretty impressive. Okay, next up, number 18 is Plain Bad Heroines by Emily M. Danforth. I loved this book so, so much. It is a slow burn, kind of gothic feeling queer horror novel that is doing stuff around the boarding school trope set across multiple timelines ranging from the late 1800s all the way up to modern day and it has nested storytelling in it which I am a huge fan of so it's got like a story within a story within a story that all kind of come together by the end and it's a uh, it's a slow creeping kind of horror it's not super scary but it's got 
really creepy stuff that gets creepier the further you get. I also thought this was so smart in the things that it was unpacking and the way that it was celebrating sapphic relationships and the existence of queer women across time, um, even though they're sometimes erased from ideas of history. So I thought Plain Bad Heroines was fantastic. And another thing that you're going to see frequently in this list, and I think I, I kind of knew this, but this year has really hit home for me, the fact that I am a huge fan of reading about the unlikable female characters, prickly, grumpy heroines, uh, morally gray heroines. I love them. I really love reading stories about them. And this is definitely a book about that, hence the plain bad heroines, kind of deconstructing this idea that our heroines always need to be pretty and always need to be nice. And I just appreciated that as a project. I love the way this was executed. And it's illustrated, which I think adds a lot to to the experience of reading a book. So really loved this one. Then in the number 17 spot is a book that I feel like was really underhyped this year. I hadn't seen a lot of people talking about it and I thought it was really very good. This is Chosen Ones by Veronica Roth. It is her first novel for adults and it is mostly science fiction, has a little bit of a sci-fi fantasy blend, but I would say lands more on the side of science fiction. And this is another one where you're gonna get that prickly heroine who is struggling. I love Loved the premise of this and I really loved the execution of it. I, like I didn't go in with very high expectations necessarily. I thought oh this might be interesting and then I just loved it. This was so <laughs> my jam. The basic idea of this is the main character is a woman who when she was a teenager was part of this group of teens who because of a prophecy were brought together by the government and trained in like powers and abilities and whatever to defeat this evil guy. And so they did that when they were teenagers and now we are fast forwarding to 10 years later where they are all dealing with anxiety and PTSD and like a lot of issues because of the trauma of what they experienced back when that happened. And then a bad guy shows up again. <laughs> and uh, I really loved this. I loved that idea of exploring what is it like to be in the limelight for things like that? What is it like to deal with trauma as an adult from things you experienced as a young person? And what would it be like for superheroes, you know, these teens that we get in these stories and like the Hunger Games or whatever, who are then having to process that trauma as adults in the future. I think that concept is really interesting. One thing I will say about this book is at some point in the plot, and I can't give details because it's super spoilery, there is a, a switch that takes place that dramatically changes um, things about the tone and the plot of the book. And that works for some people, it doesn't work for other people. I really loved it. I loved both pre-switch and post-switch, I guess you could say, and I was a huge fan of this. So I, I wish more people would pick it up. It was one of my favorite books of the year. All right. What is that? 17? Number 16 this year was Lobizona by Ramina Garber. Oh, this was so good and I'm really excited to do a reread of it this year before the sequel comes out. It's the first book in a YA fantasy series that's kind of an interesting genre blend. It has elements of paranormal fantasy and elements of portal fantasy and this was just so much fun but also thematically rich and I, I think that's something I really enjoy. I like books that have interesting ideas or themes that they're playing with but also tell a really fun story and I thought that Lobizono was a great example of that. It's got werewolves and witches and like <laughs> this great portal fantasy story that I don't want to say too much about because I don't want to spoil things but it's also a book that is tackling prejudice against undocumented immigrants. It's a book that is tackling racism and misogyny and homophobia and I just thought this was so good. I had a really fun time reading it. It definitely left an impression and uh, can't wait to read book two in 2021. Number 15 on my list is the first of two nonfiction books that made it on my favorites list for the year. This one is Hood Feminism Notes from the Women That a Movement Forgot by Mickey Kendall. Ooh man, this was so good. I've been recommending this to a lot of people and I don't think I've seen anybody dislike it unless it's because they're not a feminist. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I guess then you wouldn't like it if you like are, you know, misogynistic and racist, then you probably wouldn't like it. But I, I thought this was so incredibly good. Uh, as you can see, I kind of tabbed the hell out of it. And this is a book that really deconstructs the problems with white feminism and the very real issues that affect the lives of women of color and marginalized women and poor women that are not 
included in white forms of feminism that are more about like women being able to get to the top and be CEOs and I just thought this book was so very good it was incisive it was thought-provoking and I just got a lot out of it um, so highly recommend this and it for sure was gonna make my favorites list of the year number 14 is part of a, a set of series that I kind of shamelessly love even though I know not everybody this is not everybody's thing but I am a longtime fan of this world and in my opinion at least for me this is my favorite book by this author that she's ever written uh, that is Chain of Gold by Cassandra Clare. It's the first book in the Last Hours series which takes place after the events of the Infernal Devices follows the children of the characters in that. I have been reading books in the Shadowhunter world for a very very long time. Um, <laughs> since I was like in my early 20s and I love the world that she has created. I know the first series certainly has its problems. I do think her writing has improved but I love a lot of what Cassandra Clare has created. I love the world. I love so many of these characters and at least for me the books keep getting better and better and Chain of Gold was for sure my favorite. I had so much fun with this. Um, I was also lucky enough to have a advanced copy of the book and so I did a whole reading vlog. So if you are interested in that I can link it up above but I did a whole reading vlog of the experience of of this and it was so much fun and made me so happy getting to see all of these characters and I yeah I just loved it a lot and I can't wait to continue on with the series. Coming in at number 13 is another debut that I loved a lot. I actually read this book twice in 2020 and enjoyed it a whole lot the second time through as well. This is Where Dreams Descend by Janella Angelis. Guys, I love this so, so much, and I can't wait for book two in the duology. This has so much atmosphere and, like, like rich settings and visual elements and I loved the the angst and the characters and the, the the darkness. I know this is not for everybody. It's definitely not a plot driven story. It's a lot about the vibe and the atmosphere and I just ate it up. This is kind of a play on Moulin Rouge meets Phantom of the Opera but in its own fantasy world with a strong female lead and mysteries that you have to unpack. The thing that I really love about this book too is it's the kind of book that will reward close reading and you're gonna get more of your questions about what's going on and about the world answered if you read it closely and really like dissect and think about all of the little clues that she drops throughout the book. I know that that is not to everybody's taste. Some people are like I, I don't want to have to work to figure out this story. I get it but I love that. Like some of my favorite books and favorite authors are people who do that where like you're gonna get more from the story if you read it closely and even if you do rereads and I, I think this is a book like that. It's a really strong debut. I had such a good time with it and yeah it was it was a lot of fun. Can't wait for the second book in the duology in 2021. Number 12 on my favorites list this year is Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. I am a huge fan of Silvia Miranda Garcia's writing. This is one of my favorite books by her and I've read almost everything that she's written with the exception of one book at this point and I just thought this was so smart and so well executed. It is an adult horror novel and this is something that this is not the only case <laughs> <laughs> of this happening. We're gonna talk about it again. But a, a thing that is kind of a pet peeve of mine that I see happen very frequently is a lot of times when genre fiction, fantasy, sci-fi, horror, etc. is written by women instead of men, people will assume it's YA. And I, I find this to be frustrating because well I mean like it's based in kind of misogyny and I know it's not always intended that way but I would just encourage you if you are reading a book and you're talking about it or reviewing it check to see who the audience is actually for and don't just make assumptions based on the age of the character. I sometimes even see this in books where the character is like in their mid-20s and people will be like oh yeah it's this YA book. I'm like it's it's not YA. Like it's not it's not YA. Um, if you're wondering how you can figure that out there's a few things. One is you can look at the imprint of who is publishing it. This is by Del Rey. Del Rey doesn't publish YA. Orbit doesn't publish YA. Tor doesn't publish YA. Tortine does and uh, you know Penguin Teen and Harper Teen and you can easily tell it. The other thing is that uh, adult hardcovers typically are about $10 more expensive than most YA. So if it's $27 or $28 it's probably adult. If it's like 
19 to 23 dollars is probably YA. So just, you know, check <laughs> because it's a problem and it's a problem particularly with women writing in genre fiction, women of color writing in genre fiction, and this was something I saw with Mexican Gothic. So two things are this is not a romance and it's not YA, it is adult horror and it is a gothic horror which means it is slow burn, it's character driven, it gets creepier and at least in my opinion much more disturbing the further you get into it but it takes its time. So if you're looking for a thriller that's not what you're gonna get here but I loved it and I thought it was so smart. It definitely does have a lot of intense disturbing elements and things that some people didn't like. Like for instance the fact that it includes instances of sexual assault, but I think the reason that she does include those in a horror novel is it's a way of getting at topics like colonization and colonization of the body and racism and misogyny and a lot of different things. I thought this was really well done, really smart. As with any of the books that I love that are in the horror genre particularly, do check content warnings because usually they're going to have a lot of them if, if, if you need those, and this is no exception, but I really loved Mexican Gothic and I will be reading whatever else we get from Silvia Moreno Garcia in the future. All right, we're almost to my top 10. Coming in at number 11 is yet another debut that I loved and another one with prickly heroines. And in fact, I would say that this book is a love letter to the unlikable female character. And that is Beyond the Ruby Veil by Mara Fitzgerald. This is another one that I haven't seen a lot of other people talking about, but I loved it. I devoured this thing in like 24 hours and got to the end and was like, oh my gosh, where's the next book? I need more. Um, I know she's still writing book two, but I wish I had it already. I loved this. It's YA, dark fantasy, definitely gets dark, definitely gets bloody. It has a super slow burn sapphic romance at the center of it. And the main character is, you know, she's not good. <laughs> She is, you know, makes bad choices. She's an unlikable female character, but I, I loved it so, so much. Um, yeah, this was like my jam. So number 11, Beyond the Ruby Veil. In my number 10 spot is one that I'm sure you're expecting to see on the list. You may be surprised to know that this was actually not my favorite romance that I read this year, but it was my favorite 2020 release in the romance genre this year. And that is, of course, spoiler alert by Olivia Dade. I mean, I have gushed about this <laughs> so much on my channel, but I absolutely loved this book for so many different reasons. Number one, the cover, the fat rep, like this is the fat rep I want in my romance. This is, th this is it. It's so so good, so well executed. Um, you get a confident fat woman who occasionally has some insecurities, but there are reasons for that, and she's growing and, and learning and loving herself. It's got this great relationship. It's got fandom elements to it, even with older characters. Our heroine is like 35 or 36, and the hero is about to turn 40. And I, I love this whole thing of like, yes, we can be like geeky grown-ups who like cosplay and fan fiction. I think that's awesome absolutely loved this. Can't wait to read more from Olivia Dade in the future. And uh, favorite 2020 romance release and second favorite romance of the year, number 10 on my favorites list. Okay, the next couple of books are controversial, but look, what else is new? I there A lot of my favorite books seem to be fairly controversial. Number nine on my list is Fledgling by Octavia Butler. I loved this book so much. I found it to be so interesting and smart and thought-provoking and I really liked what it was doing. It is for sure controversial. If you want to hear more about that, check out my Goodreads review. I do have Goodreads reviews for all of the books on this list and all of the books that I read this year, so that is always linked down below if you want to check it out. That said, this is Octavia Butler's take on a vampire story and it's a really interesting genre blend as well. It's kind of a mix of, it's kind of a vampire story that sometimes reads like an ethnography but is also a murder mystery and a courtroom drama. Like it's a really interesting book and I like the themes that it's tackling and the way it intends to make the reader uncomfortable comfortable in order to think about some of those topics. So um, really loved Fledgling, looking forward to reading more from Octavia Butler going into the next year. Number eight on my list this year is The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires by Grady Hendrix. This is such an interesting book and another one that has been a little bit controversial, although I would argue, <laughs> I, I, I would argue that sometimes that's because people aren't 
really reading what he's doing with this book. I thought this was so smart. It's set in the 1990s in a suburban town in the south following a group of middle-aged white ladies who have a book club and are into reading true crime and there is a vampire at play here but it's using it as a way of talking about racism and white flight and sort of the insidious side of racism where it's not as overt but where people will care much more about what happens to white children than what happens to black children among other things. I've heard people say that they think this is racist and misogynistic. I disagree. I think that the entire premise of the book is intended to subvert racism and misogyny and shine a light on the way that it existed in the South in the 90s and the ways that it is so insidious, so I, I would disagree with that statement, but uh, for sure this does have a lot of content trigger warnings, so check them out if you need them, including things like child predation and some grittier horror elements. This is definitely a horror novel, but I really loved it. I loved what it was, was doing, and it was very readable. I read it in like a day or two and didn't want to put it down, so definitely a fave of the year. Number seven is also one of my biggest surprises of the year. I don't know that I had high expectations going in, but I loved this book and can't wait to continue with the series this year. This is Semlin Ascends by Josiah Bancroft. It is the first book in an adult fantasy story that is really, really unique. It's not like anything else that I've read. And this is also a book that does one of those things I said I love in my books, which is where there are puzzle pieces that if you pick up on the hints and put all of the things together, you get a bigger picture and things make sense. And I, I just love that in a reading experience. It's so fun for me. <laughs> and this is definitely a book that does it. I think the character work here is really interesting. The themes and ideas it's playing with are really interesting and it's just not like anything else I've read. Um, I have already purchased the next two books in the series and the final book is supposed to come out sometime in fall of 2021 so this is one that I would like to catch up with and continue with but really loved it a lot. It's one that has stuck with me throughout the year and yeah. Number six is my actual favorite romance that I read this year and that is is Grip by Kennedy Ryan. Wow, this book was so, so good. I really want to read more from Kennedy Ryan going into the next year. I'm so glad I finally gave some of her stuff a try. Grip, I think, particularly resonated with me because I think this is one of the best depictions I have ever seen in a romance of a lot of the very real issues that come up when you're in an interracial relationship. The hero in this book is black and the heroine is white, and while there are elements of this book that are for sure very soapy and melodramatic, which I enjoyed, like don't get it wrong, I really loved that part of the book as well, it was a lot of fun, but also I would say this is the best book I've ever read in terms of talking about what are the things that come up and the difficulties and challenges and things that you face in society around you when you're in an interracial relationship. And, you know, obviously my husband and I have been married for almost 10 years and so I've experienced a lot of this stuff and I, I just thought this was so well executed. I really loved the characters, I loved the story, everything about it, and uh, yeah, favorite romance that I read in 2020. With that said, we are down to my top five books of the year and I love all of these books but these ones in particular man so good. In my number five spot is a book that I read in December and it just blew my mind and kind of rocketed way up my list of favorites and in my opinion this is the best YA debut of 2020. That is Legend Born by Tracy Dion. Wow, this book was so, so good. I had heard a lot of people talking about it and was kind of interested, but I just kept hearing so many positive things. And so I was finally like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the audiobook from my library, get a copy from Book of the Month Club, and we're gonna, we're gonna do this. It kind of blew my mind, you guys. This book is incredible and so well done. And I can't believe it's a debut. Just the crafting here and all of the different issues that it's grappling with and the storytelling and the character work like ever th this just did everything so well <laughs> like I have no complaints about this book it was incredible what's interesting about this is it's being pitched as a retelling of Arthurian legends which kind of but kind of not it is using Arthurian mythology as the basis for the magic system and the basis for this secret magical society that exists in the book but it's really doing its own thing and it is set in the modern day I've been calling this Cassandra Clare meets Octavia Butler and I think that's pretty apt 
it's like a better version of Cassandra Clare's earlier work. Like it does similar things, but better. It's a book where there is magic interacting with our real world in a secret way. There's a secret magical organization. There are political machinations going on. There are gross demons that need to be killed. It's got an action packed plot. It's got romance. Like it's got all of those elements that you would find in the Mortal Instruments series, but like better. <laughs> basically. However, it's also tackling some pretty big thematic content and doing it so well. This deals with things like grief and generational trauma, racism and microaggressions, misogyny, and in all of this it's centering a black teen girl and letting her do everything from use magic and kick monster butt to wear a gorgeous ball gown, and I loved it. I love everything it's doing. I'm very excited to see where the series is going to go next, and uh, yeah, definitely one of my top five books of the year, and I would say the best YA debut I read. Number four is my favorite adult fantasy that I read this year, and that is Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. <sighs> Guys, this book was also just so freaking good. I loved it so much. It's a multi-POV adult epic fantasy with a world and magic system that are inspired by Aztec and Mayan mythology, and I would say even if you didn't like the other stuff by Rebecca Roanhorse, give this a try because it's very, very different. It's super fast-paced. It's got interesting characters and a richness to the mythology and world building. Um, and I loved everything about it. It's got one of the wildest, most intense opening scenes in the first chapter, and it ends on this crazy cliffhanger that made me want book two immediately. I loved it. I thought it was just perfect. <laughs> I had no complaints about it. The, the main complaints that I am hearing from it are people who are used to reading epic fantasy that has a lot more information in it, that takes its time being more slow paced and giving you lots and lots of information in world building, like Brandon Sanderson, for instance. And for them, they're saying, I wanted more, like it was really good, but I wanted more development of the world and stuff. So depending on what it is that you like in your fantasy, you may or may not get along with it. I like both things. I mean, I like the more epic, give me lots of information fantasy, but I also really love this. And if you don't like fantasy that gives you too much information and detail that you don't feel like you need, then I would definitely say give Black Sun a try. Um, yeah, favorite fantasy of the year. Number three is the other nonfiction book that's on this list, although what's interesting about this is it uses an experimental format in writing that gives it fictional qualities to it, and uh, it's also very hard-hitting. This is In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. It's a memoir of her experience being in an abusive relationship with another woman. And like I said, it's told in this experimental style that really worked for me. I thought the writing was beautiful and the imagery just worked so well. This is definitely a very intense book. It deals with a lot of very difficult topics. It's very hard hitting and it is has still really stuck with me even though it's one of the earliest books I read this year. I read it all the way back in January and as soon as I finished it I knew I wanted to own my own copy and eventually I would like to go back and reread it and um, put tabs in it because I thought this was incredible. And if you saw my TBR swap vlog with Ashley from Bookish Realm you might see that this is one of the books that I sent to her because I thought it was so good and she also really really loved it but had a hard time getting through it because it's, it's very intense. Um, but yeah this was one of my favorite books that I read this year and I also think what it's doing is really important in highlighting the very real existence of abuse in queer relationships and between in relationships between women and also the fact that abuse isn't always physical. It can also be verbal and psychological and financial and um, it's it's terrifying and not really talked about or studied and so I think it's an important book. It's a very well done book and uh, one of my one of my favorite books that I read this year. All right so we are down to my final two. The number two spot is going to a book that I think just hit home for me really personally and emotionally left a really big impression on me. I know this isn't everybody's favorite book. A lot of people who I've seen read it have said, oh yeah, it was fine. Um, but for some reasons that I'll talk about, this one really left an impression, and that is To Be Taught If Fortunate by Becky Chambers. I have finally started reading Becky Chambers this year, and I love her writing. This book in particular, though, quickly became a new favorite for me. 
It follows a woman who is part of a small scientific mission in space to go and visit these different planets and gain information. And I, I just loved it. This is one of a handful of books that made me cry <laughs> this year because not I, I rarely cry reading books and this is one that did make me cry and uh, just struck a really intense chord with me. And I think part of the reason for it is so I grew up watching a lot of Star Trek. I, I love it. My mom was a big fan of Star Trek. So I grew up on Next Generation and Voyager and some of the original series. And then of course, when I was older, I watched the movies too, when they started coming out. But this, I think, really embodies the ethos of Star Trek, of the show in its original form, which is about exploring the universe, but without doing harm and without leaving a footprint where you are and embracing the the culture and the nature of the places that you go and that is really what to be taught a fortunate is about and i just thought it was so beautiful it made me cry and um yeah this is just it, it holds a dear place in my heart and i really loved it a lot so that is my second favorite book of 2020 and then finally my favorite book of the year my favorite debut of the year also and i i don't know if people are necessarily going to expect that this was my favorite book of the year i feel like like this might be a little bit surprising but this is a book that the longer I've sat with it the more I have come to love and appreciate it and love what it's doing and that is The Year of the Witching by Alexis Henderson. I'm gonna say like I did with Mexican Gothic this is another book that I've seen a lot of people talk about as YA. It is not YA. It is adult horror. It's not historical fiction. It's not fantasy. It is adult horror and um I think that's particularly important because like the author in fact has said like look this needs to not be shelved for teenagers this is not written for teenagers the content is very mature even if the main character is like 20 or so um it's definitely written for an adult audience that said i loved this a whole lot i thought it was incredibly well executed it definitely has some gothic horror vibes to it and it has you know traditional horror elements like creepy scenes dark forest evil witches bloody stuff like it's got all of those elements but i think what really elevated this for me and made it a favorite and made it really work for me and stick with me is that the the further you read into this book the more you come to realize that even though there are those traditional horror elements the true horror is not that the true horror of the book is the misogyny and the abuse of power and the religious abuse that is taking place behind the scenes it follows a young woman who is coming of age in a small town run by a kind of cultish religious organization and uh yeah i i, I don't want to say too too much about it but i think this has been pitched as salem meets the handmaid's tale and that is like pretty apt for a lot of what this is doing but i really loved it i thought it was so well done and then i found out we're getting a book two which this stands alone you don't need to read a book two but if you want to give me more i will definitely take it i just love this a whole lot it was my favorite book that i read this year one that really stuck with me and my favorite overall debut for 2020. So there it is. Favorite book of the year. There they are. Those are my top 20 books that I read in 2020. I have so much love for all of these books. I think they're doing really interesting things and they're things that have stuck with me and resonated with me. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on any of the books that I talked about today. And for your question of the day, let me know what was one of your favorite books of the year and why you loved it so much let me know in the comments down below. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you want to see more, and if you want to support the work of the channel, check out the Patreon linked down below. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.